Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session uh, of addressing challenges in Half Valley management. I just want to remind everyone this is a recorded webinar section, so I highly encourage you to come sit forward closer to the screen, um, and also when you're asking questions at the end of this section, um, just kind of very clearly state your questions and uh, introduce yourself. That will be very helpful. So with no further ado, I would like to introduce uh, my very dear good uh, speakers today. Dr. Smith, coming from uh, West University, uh, Western University. Uh, he has previously worked at the University of Ottawa uh, Heart Institute as the medical director, Heart Failure Program, as well as subsequently at St. Mary Cadillac uh, Center in Waterloo. Um, his current interests include healthcare delivery, outcome and knowledge translation in clinical practice, as it applies to overall high failure care as well as advanced high failure treatment. And along with him is uh, Ms. Leister, who is a nurse practitioner within the cardiac program at London Health Science Center. Um, she has worked as a nurse practitioner in the cardiovascular field for the past 15 years in both inpatient unit and outpatient cardiac clinics. And um, more recently, she has um, she is currently working, um, uh, uh, studying at Western University as a PhD nursing program in healthcare service del delivery, focusing on health uh, heart failure management. Um, she is a proud recipient of the Ontario Graduate Scholarship, as well as London Health Science Research Heart Transplant Fund uh, that support her current uh, PhD study. So I'm going to turn this to our speaker. Thanks very much. Uh, I have a mic on, so it makes it easier for me. Uh, I'm just going to take my, I'll take that. Um, good morning. So our, where I talk this morning is addressing challenges in heart failure. So again, it might be easier for you people to move over this way if you want to see things. If you don't want to see things, that's fine. But uh, the slides are over here. This is a workshop. So I know you were told to uh, state your name. I want to do that. but. If as we go through it, I would far rather you ask questions as we go along. Yes, we have lots of content. We, can, we want time to, to answer questions, but I want to stop and make sure you understand things as well. Okay, so be, feel free to put your hand up and say, can you just clarify that? We won't get into lengthy, record, lengthy uh, answers at that point, but we want to make sure people understand what's going on and take advantage as we go through a fair amount of material. But again, there's no need for us to get through everything. We're here for mainly your education. As I said, there's some handouts in the back. And hopefully there's some left. There should be enough for the people registered. So uh, our faculty disclosure, we've talked about uh, mitigating potential, potential bias. Uh, everything I'm going to talk about is available. I'll introduce you to some new things coming out, but they are already Health Canada approved. Uh, learning objectives, I want to identify and explain the classifications of heart failure the way we talked about today. Epidemiology, treatment and options, I'll just introduce that. Talk about really the whole issue of what are factors that lead to recurrent hospital admissions and poor outcomes. And this is a big issue for me both at the hospital level but also at the LIN level and at the Ministry of Health and you'll introduce that to you. Talk about some strategies you can do in your own office. Uh, to improve outcomes. I want to emphasize doing, doing the simple things well is what you need to concentrate on. You don't need to do fancy things. A uh, couple of common management programs which are becoming problems which are becoming more of an issue today. And then some new topics. So let's talk, I decided this year to put uh, slides up from since I have access to this uh, on the burden of heart failure in Ontario. Uh, so a lot of people have heart failure you can see, we all recognize that it's a progressive condition with a high mortality, high morbidity. And you can see from this slide that as people age, it's, uh, it's an increasing proportion of patients. However, in my practice, I have patients who are teenagers all the way through. Clearly, older patients uh, have it more likely. In Ontario, 66,000 hospitalizations included heart failure as, as a primary or secondary diagnosis with an average length of stay of 12 days. And 25,000 hospitalizations were just primary diagnosis of heart failure in the province with an average of nine days. And so I think it's important to see that is that as a comorbid illness, heart failure is associated. Uh, 770,000 hospital days, uh, days in hospital per year in Ontario. 
Note the in-hospital mortality is quite high, 12.5%. All-cause one-year mortality is 33% for anyone coming to hospital. Granted, they're older patients, but in Ontario, all-cause mortality is quite high. 30-day readmission actually in Ontario has actually improved. You'll see the data for elsewhere, about 16%. Now I want to put some LIN stuff there. So we come from different parts of the province. You can see the various LINs across the bottom. I circled our LIN, which is the Southwest LIN. And this is looking at incidence of or prevalence of, of heart failure. And you can see that uh, uh, this is the uh, North, Northern Ontario. And this is Oakville, Mississauga. And as you go across and read the bottom here and look at your LIN, you'll see that there's a common theme. Good social situations lead to good outcomes. Poor social situations lead to bad outcomes. So access to care is huge. So you want to live in, in I can tell you, you want to live in Oakville, you want to live in Mississauga, and you want to live in Sunnybrook area. So uh, those are the places to live. If you look at heart failure hospitalizations, which is really the big issue that addresses us, because we, we want people to live longer, but we also want a good quality of life and no hospitalizations. Most common over 65, 44% of patients overall are readmitted after one year. And you can see readmission rates that range to 25%. You saw in Ontario a bit less. Uh, again, it's really regional dependent and also those numbers are skewed by better outcomes in smaller places, poorer outcomes in, in places like Northern Ontario. I can tell you that uh, we actually have a pretty good LHSC. We're around 18% readmission rate and I can tell you the hospital still complains. Um, to me all the time. Uh, again, to give you an Ontario flavor to this of rehospitalization rates, this is looking at rehospitalization rates uh, uh, for patients. You can see again, if you live in the north, high rates, lack of access to care. Uh, again, here we are, uh, Southwest Lynn. One of our problems is we have one major centre in a huge Lynn. We go from near Chatham, Lake Erie, all the way up to, to Tobermory and across to the edge of Collingwood. So a huge Lynn with a huge rural com component and that's where the problem exists. But again, if you live over here in Mississauga, Oakville, you're going to do really well uh, overall from a hospitalization rate. So I think the big thing we want to talk about, I want you to think about as we go through this talk today is what are the gaps in heart failure care and include they fall into a bunch of categories. It's a common phrase used, but I think the gaps may be different in different regions depending on what your resources are, et cetera, and your abilities. So diagnosis is really a big issue and we're going to talk a little bit about today and some of the things just to help you with that. Um, acute care and hospital, I won't spend so much about that today because I, I really want to concentrate on our day-to-day -day care of patients. Post, uh, but patient issues are huge. Social, cognitive, these are huge issues for us. We have a big heart failure program in London at St. Joe's, five days a week, all day, two nurse practitioners, two nurses, uh, dietitians, all the, the bells and whistles, four heart failure cardiologists, nephrologists, access to palliative care. Half the patients in that clinic are social. Those are the issues, social and cognitive. That's why they keep being readmitted. You get to that clinic because you're readmitted to hospital. That's how you get into that clinic. We're not seeing people just for diagnosis, we're seeing people are readmitted. So that's a huge issue if you want to have an impact. Post-discharge also is a huge issue, we all know that that's always the elephant in the room uh, for hospitals and for all of us is how do we improve that and uh, I think I'm sure you have complaints about us and we understand that totally and specialists not getting the information to you. So with that in mind, understanding the burden and the also hospitalization, remember why is hospitalization so important? Well, you can see we all recognize that this is a time course with progression of heart failure. And as the disease progresses, this can occur over months to years and usually hopefully years. But every time you have an admission, it actually deteriorates. And you can see the mortality still is quite high overall. But the important thing here is on this slide here, look at with each hospitalization, your mortality goes up. So every time we hospitalize a patient, a patient takes another two steps backwards and they're going to get worse and worse and so their chances of mortality increase with each hospitalization. So the only thing we can do is to try and change that trajectory by improving our care and some of them are simple and some are not and sometimes we just can't improve the tra trajectory. But it's important to realize hospitalization is bad for outcomes. And I put this slide up just to, to highlight 
mortality rate is higher for heart failure patients than many cancers. And this looks at survival rates in cancers in men and women. You can see heart failure here. The only thing really worse at five, at, uh, eight, five years, eight years, is really uh, is lung cancer. Bowel cancer, very similar to heart failure overall, so metastatic bowel cancer. Uh, and the same, similar in women. I don't think people really think of that way, because even palliative care is all cancer focused. It's very difficult to get palliative care for non-cancer, yet we have a, a condition that has very similar outcomes. And you know, why are heart failure patients not managed with the same urgency as patients diagnosed with cancer? Because the same issues, same groups of patients, all ages, but older patients, yet we take years to get patients on meds and get them properly treated. So I point this out as, as again, a food for thought for people. And so these are things we work at the, are working with the Ministry of Health to try and address those issues. So now I'm going to move on to the next step uh, of talking about, that's a bit about the epidemiology where we are in Ontario. Gives you an idea of what's going on, what's old and what's new. I'm going to take you quickly through. I'm not here to redo all of heart failure for you in the next 15 minutes, but we're going to take you through a couple of things. So heart failure, there's lots of definitions. So I learned about the inability to meet the metabolic demands, sort of a useless definition. There's about four or five definitions out there. But here, heart failure is a clinical syndrome characterized by symptoms of breathlessness, ankle swelling, uh, fatigue. It's accompanied by signs, elevated JVP, pulmonary crackles, peripheral edema. So it's a purely clinical. It's caused by structural and, unctu- and functional cardiac abnormality resulting in reduced cardiac output and or elevated filling pressures. At no point in that definition does it say anything about ejection fraction. It just talks a bit about the syndrome. So it's important to remember that uh, because that's, because that's certainly when I trained, we only thought about patients with poor LV function. So I want to emphasize again that heart failure is not a, is a syndrome, it's not a disease. Uh, and so it means that uh, you have to think of that as a result of being a syndrome, there are diverse etiologies to that condition. Uh, with m- multiple different mechanisms depending on the cause. And that's what leads to the complexity of the diagnosis. I put this slide up because, again, when I trained, the only thing we had really was this, and we had what we called over here diastolic heart failure, which is really not a very good terminology. So from a practical standpoint, I will, I will say to you, I think that's a bad terminology. It's not practical for you. You should just forget it. Patients who have systolic heart failure all have diastolic abnormalities. Diastolic abnormalities occur in all old people. So as you age, we have diastolic abnormalities. If people have atrial fibrillation, you cannot assess diastolic abnormalities. They don't actually help you with your treatment. So you really have to think about the the causes. So systolic heart failure, pretty simple. EF less than 40%. Most common cause, ischemic, 66% in the community. 10% is valves, congenital. We can tell that off an echo. And this non-ischemic grab bag, which in many is idiopathic, but certainly thought to be genetics, may be playing at least 30% of the cause. And of course, there's secondary causes, but it's pretty simple because heart disease or heart failure is always a late finding when it's a secondary, part of a secondary disease, i.e. Rheumato- uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, some of the connective tissue diseases, etc. cetera. Um, heart failure preserved EF, I'm putting 45, 50%. Uh, that's sort of what we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. It's got a huge differential. And if you think about it, what are things would give you that constellation of symptoms, i.e. shortness of breath, fatigue, edema, uh, elevated JVP? Well, we can go through all the various things. And if I went around the room, I could give you a list as long as your arm, but I'll start off with a couple. So constricted pericarditis, pulmonary hypertension. We'll do the diastolic heart failure sector into hypertension, but that's not that common today. Uh, mitral regurgitation with preserved LV function, aortic valve disease with preserved function, uh, uh, cancer, uh, some of the drugs, uh, uh, hemochromatosis can be either or. So on it goes, there are different causes and there's nothing similar about any of those conditions. They're all different, so that makes it challenging uh, overall. So the diagnostic algorithm is the same, but note that the treatment for what we do is evidence-based and the treatment for this is not evidence-based. And because the difference in etiologies, it's important to realize that when a patient comes to the emergency room or comes into your hospital, you can't say everyone needs an ACE inhibitor or beta blocker, because that may not be the proper treatment for this kind of patient over here, and may actually make things worse. So 
but that's, so just beware the two different broad classifications. Now we, I'm gonna make it a little bit more complicated. Now there's HEF-REF, which is the systolic dysfunction, what we all know about. There's HEF-PEF, now we've further discussed that as described as, as EF greater than 50% now, and HEF-MEF, which is 40 to 50%. Most of this is really more for research purposes. Uh, from a practical purpose for your situation, just think of this as one. HEF-MEF and HEF-PEF is the same. Some of these are patients who may go this way or could go this way, uh, but again, no clear evidence for how to best deal with these patients overall. So essentially the same, but the conditions are the same. So the elevated natural peptides, some sort of structural abnormality uh, uh, with the heart disease, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So the next thing I wanna talk about is just the pathophysiology, because I think it's important just to tell you where we're at and get people to start thinking, because it helps in taking to the next steps of therapy, and again, even to that handout we have uh, given you. So if you think about it, there's patients who are at risk for developing heart flare, clearly hypertension historically, atherosclerosis, they have a, a previous uh, coronary disease, diabetes, you've got diabetes, 30% chance of having heart flare in the course of your life. Uh, obesity, definitely, metabolic syndrome. And then there's patients who get it from secondary things like cancer chemotherapy. Most common cause for heart transplant for us in a woman is cancer chemotherapy. Genetics, and then there may be infectious, the also myocarditis slash inflammatory type of scenarios. I put this note, I said stage A. These are inciting factors. They aren't the cause, but it's important to think that way because that's part where you can actually intervene. This leads to some sort of insult to the heart, myocardial damage. So when it happens, hard to know, because these insults, these things can be here for days to years before they actually cause a problem. You get the myocardial damage, affects contractility, or increases filling pressures, leads to some sort of remodeling and ventricular dysfunction. All this activates the neural hormonal system, uh, which is our understanding of what leads to all this. So these neural hormones lead to remodeling, necrosis, affect contractility, Ultimately, one of the things that feeds to is sodium water retention and heart failure symptoms overall. Again, note that stage B, this factor here, there's a large asymptomatic proportion. So when patients come to you in the office or come to us, uh, the idea, oh, this just happened yesterday. Well, no, it doesn't happen yesterday. I just saw one last week where they insisted the, his young guy it came, happened yesterday. His heart size was huge. He was 85. That's huge, that didn't happen overnight. His ECG's changed. If you go back, I found, happened to find ECG from some trauma from about three years ago. It wasn't normal when he was 28, when he had his trauma. It wasn't grossly abnormal, but it wasn't normal then. So clearly the process was starting then, but he never realized it until he presented it to his symptoms. And then, so that months to years can occur. After a big heart attack, that might just be months. I have one guy, we're transplanting this hopefully soon, he just had his big event last April, completely downhill course, regardless of all the things we did. Other people, years. And then this symptomatic heart, stage C, symptomatic heart for end stage, again, could be months to 10 to 15 years on average now. So I want to get into thinking of this is what happens, the damage, this period of asymptomatic damage can occur for a while. And these are parts where you might be able to intervene and then stage C is really where the symptomatic heart failure, and again, this can be interfered. And so what is the neuromonal heart failure system? So we have the sympathetic system. We, our upper understanding that was the sympathetic system, activation of it, uh, and then the renangiotensin system. And this is what we understood until about, about four or five years ago. And now, and so our therapies, beta blockers, ACE, ARBs, MRAs, all come from here. But now we recognize that there's actually a natural peptide system. And so it's a yin and a yang. And we, this also plays a role overall. And we'll talk a bit about it as well. So it's actually three aspects to the neurohormone system, which is new. So this is something many people in the room may not be aware of now. We have concentrated previously on this and not so much on that. But now this is really a very important system because now we, have, we can have drugs to interfere with all these factors uh, and may hopefully out improve outcomes. And so this leads to this whole idea of neurohormonal imbalance. I won't spend two other things, but I illustrate, I made up the comment of yin and yang. You have the yin and the yang over here, the pathophysiological responses, the 
the uh, adaptive and maladaptive responses of the renin-angiotensin system and the catecholines, and then you have the beneficial effects of upregulating the NEP, the nephrolysin system, and we'll talk about that. And that's lead to a new view of what we look at heart failure management and how we do things. So that's our understanding of pathophysiology, uh, where we are at that. You can see the progression and again, where we at. And again, I want you to start thinking about stages of heart failure. That's more important because that, those are places you can intervene along the way. Especially when you see a patient who fits that category, pre MI, chemotherapy, that uh, diabetes. Most important part in heart failure management is diagnosis, diagnosis, diagnosis. And the reason, the reason for that has to do with the ejection fraction. Because without an echocardiogram, you don't actually know what kind of heart failure your patient. They all look the same, the phenotype's the same. But you don't know, do they have LV dysfunction or do they have preserved LV function? One, you got lots of evidence, you can throw all those drugs at them, and other ones, you don't have any evidence whatsoever other than diuretics and treat the underlying condition. So you need at some point to get an echocardiogram uh, to, some, to be able to look at, and that's key. That's not a new concept. But echoes are useful for two things. One, prognosis. So they're helpful for me to tell how bad the prognosis is. After that, that's sort of it. Low EFs don't necessarily mean you're going to die any more than the, guy upper, the, higher, the EF of 30%. But the second thing is that the most important thing is they tell you the diagnosis, HEFPEF or HEFREF, and that determines therapy. The thing I want to introduce to you is the idea of this, this is from the European, which is something we're trying in a, in a project that we're doing uh, in the community, is if a patient came to your office with dyspnea, a lot of the thing is let's make a referral to a cardiologist and turn us to deal with it. Or you know, people do different things, some with their chest x-ray, some like referral. But not all people coming will have heart failure, in fact many won't. But if you ordered a natriuretic peptide in the office for that dyspnea patient, you could very quickly tell is this likely heart or not. And in, then you can decide on the appropriate. Uh, so if natriuretic peptide is low, then it's not heart, then you can carry on doing whatever you want to do. Uh, respiratory, look for other causes. But if it's high, you, that may be where it's helpful. Okay, so that's something, again, as a primary care physician, as some work with a family health team, a patient comes to your office, not that sick, but complaining of dysmic for the last couple months, then that might be a very useful test. The only downside is patients have to pay for it, but it's maybe a test worthwhile. Again, there's some data, I'm not going to spend this doing, going through data from Europe, suggesting this is a very good screening situation, uh, even before you do the echo, because you can get that quick, quicker than the echo, right? So you can order your echo, but if you live in a small place like our rural areas, you won't get an echo quickly. So that can be done at your local lab. And again, I can help you later on about uh, different levels. So if you have HEF-PEF or you have HEF-REF, there are different levels we can use. And it gets you on the right track for that patient who's not so symptomatic it has to be admitted to hospital or sent to emerge. Optimal management. It depends, on, again, as I said to you, on having the echo. So the echo, half ref or half pef. And this looks, I'm going to quickly go through the evidence for treatment for heart failure for half pef. This is a bunch of trials here. And if you look very closely, no reduction, no mortality, no significant change, no mortality, no reduction, no reduction, no improvement, no improvement, no improvement, no improvement. So there is no evidence for any therapy at this point in time for the management of HEF-PEF, other than to use diuretics and treat the underlying condition. But as I said to you, the, ED, the diverse etiology of the underlying condition becomes important, so you have to understand, if it's hypertension, treat their hypertension. If it's valve disease, treat their valve disease. But they're getting diuretics, that's why they came to you wet. Uh, so the current recommendations from the European, I think this is the most succinct one I put up there, so I thought it was more succinct than what well, essentially diuretics and treat the underlying conditions. So that's all you need to know about hef PEF, really, from a treatment point of view. But you need the diagnosis. If it's hef, hef ref, this just illustrates, I'm not gonna tell you anything at all, so this is the evolution of therapy as you know it, ACE inhibitors with the SOLVE trial versus diuretics and, di and digoxin. Um, uh, and you can see an improvement with overall with ACE inhibitors. Then came beta blockers. And you can see that beta blockers on top of a diuretic, ACE and DIG, improved outcome even further. Uh, and then you can see also here 
the uh, this is a Dig Ace uh, and an Arb. So this is the charm added. We actually got a bigger, bigger bang for a bucket using an MRA. So rails, trials, spermolactone. So most of us don't use combo ACE and ARB. We would prefer to use a uh, MRA like spermolactone or a plerinone. But you can see everything's on additive, and that's really what our understanding of heart failure management was for 25 years. And then came this understanding that we talked about earlier, and I gave you the pathophysiology, the renin-angiotensin system. We know the ACE is act here to block this. Valsartan acts at this level to block the uh, angiotensin 2 to, to block the angiotensin 1 receptor, and that's our understanding. But now with the NEP system, we have activation of the natural peptide system, so things like BNP is the term, uh, are elevated. These, these BNP has, a, a, has ability to increase naturesis, so there's a diuretic action to it. The, it, decre it improves remodeling, it drops hemodynamics, improves that. Patients feel better. Unfortunately, it's broken down by neprilysin quite quickly. So the new drug, sacubitril valsartan, actually the sacubitril component eliminates or decreases the breakdown of the NEP. So there's a, an increase in NEP in the brain and, and BNP to give you all those beneficial things. And then we have the, uh, a, the valsartan working on this system, the renangiotensin system, so we get added benefit. So does it make any difference? This is combined drug, all in one drug. Make any difference? Well, this is data showing uh, the, the benefits of sacubitril valsartan versus conventional therapy. And you can see significantly better outcomes with this drug. Downside, like cancer chemotherapy, and everyone, not everyone tolerates these drugs. About up to 25% of people may not tolerate it. But if you do, outcomes are better. On average, people live two years longer with good quality of life, decreased hospitalization. And I have people come to me, this is the one drug I have to say, people come and say, I feel great. I haven't felt this good in such a long, if they can get tolerate the drug. So this is a great addition to our therapy available to us now uh, uh, over the past several years. Evabradine is the other drug. This is more of a niche drug. This, is a, uh, this drug is now available. Both drugs have, are, 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 have ODB, uh, are covered by ODB for patients in the system. Uh, there's codes for LU codes for both of them. This drug here is basically targeting heart rate. So we all have these patients who are on beta blockers and their heart rates remain elevated despite being good doses of beta blockers. Or some people can't tolerate the higher dose of beta blocker because of adverse effects. Avabradine, actually when you add it to, the, to those drugs, so patients on ACE or an ARB or an Entresto or uh, di uh, and diuretics, so good therapy and their heart rate still elevated over 70, uh, then we add that drug to it, then it decreases hospitalization. Doesn't have a significant effect on survival, some, but I would say to you hospitalization is really what you're trying to do. So it's an additive therapy for a very targeted group of patients, is covered uh, and it's on the recommended therapies. So in Canada, this is from our guidelines here in Canada last year. Uh, you can see that patients should be tried with triple therapy, ACE, ARB, beta blocker, MRA, and then reassess symptoms. If they're class one, we just carry on with that, uh, as according to the guidelines today. If you're class two to four, despite that, and your heart rate's over 70, you would consider adding a Vabradine. But more importantly, I go to the sacubitril valsartan first, because that's your biggest bang for your buck. And then after that, you consider evabradine because sometimes the heart rate will actually improve with better heart flare care here. And then the same thing for this. So that's our current guidelines in Canada and echoes to worldwide. Uh, that's where we're at. So pulling it all together, um, I want you to get away from New York heart classification. By definition, a patient comes to the emergency room and their heart rate is, uh, and they're, they're going to be class four. That's why the emergency room, they can't breathe. By the time they leave, they might be class two or three. So it doesn't really help us that much. Uh, it does tell me at the point in time, if you say to me on telephone, he's class two, I know what he is, or he's class three. But that stage idea, I started to introduce you with the pathophysiology becomes important. The patient's at risk, stage A. The stage B, that structural damage done, asymptomatic, stage C. What you see is that people's functional class waxes and wanes, uh, over time, depending on their symptom control. And it may be due to progression, but the stages are progressive. They don't go back. So once you have the stages, you keep moving forward, is generally the, the rule. 
So you generally you'll see in our letters we say this person's an AHA stage C, uh, NYHA functional class 2. And that way I can tell you, you get an idea of what that patient looks like. It's exactly, it's, it's our version of what you do in the cancer chemotherapy, cancer world, uh, and they talk about the staging of their cancer, how many lymph nodes, whatever. It's the same concept of what we're doing, but this tells us. Um, that. So that's what I want to think. And then that handout I gave you, basically this is from the American Heart Association. It's not a new handout. I go over this every year. It's been out for about six years now. It's updated. Um, but you can see the stage A, the stage B. This is your situation. These are the patients at risk and the recommended therapies. Stage B is your asymptomatic. And then stage C, they've broken into HEFPEF and HEFREF. They will now, uh, and then the various therapies, including device therapy, which I haven't really talked about. And then stage D is our refractory or very advanced heart failure. So that's on that handout. It's a great handout. Great thing tells you, it gives you some guidelines of management. So that's heart failure in a, in a nutshell. I'm going to take two minutes and we're on to the next stuff. So what's the, on the horizon for heart failure management in 2019? What things can you expect? Uh, Sacubitrol valsartan, the drug I've just introduced you. It was the, when we approve drugs in Canada, it's approved based on the study was done. And clearly the study had to be done against an ACE inhibitor, which was an Alipro. Excellent study, largest heart failure study ever done. But that's how it's approved. So everyone has to be on ACE or an R before we started. That's under the current rules. There are a number of studies uh, been done and published, and I've presented on one recently uh, where we're initiating therapy in hospital. Uh, and that's again gone to Health Canada for approval and will be approved soon. So what you're going to see in the next couple of years is that this class of drugs, and this will be the first one like everything else, yeah, this will be more common with different versions of this, but the neprilysin inhibitors will become the standard of care and ACE and ARBs will become second line. So that you can expand and, and this, some of this will start occurring in the first year. So the therapy has been done given to patients in the CCU after heart attacks now. Therapy is being done for patients initiating in hospital. Uh, switching patients, so all this, uh, and some of this has already gone to Health Canada uh, for approval. HEFPEF is the exciting one, a whole bunch of trials for HEFPEF. There's some theoretical reasons why it might be useful, I don't know, and I, why it may be, as I said, diverse etiologies, but we'll see. But there are a number of trials out, and there are some theoretical reasons why it might be better. Avabradine, you're going to see more use. One of the problems before, it's a select group of patients. Fairly easy drug to use, doesn't have a lot of side effects. Not valuable for patients with atrial fib, it has to be in sinus, uh, no, uh, but uh, it's now covered by ODB, so that's good, and not particularly. The other one, which we won't talk about, uh, but cardiac amyloidosis, there are three therapies in Health Canada right now. Uh, two of them are available by special access. There are niche drugs, but uh, it's changed. We, up until now, we've had no options for cardiac amyloidosis whatsoever, uh, and now we have some potential options albeit uh, cancer price type drugs. So if you get my drift there. Uh, this just talks about current therapies for HEFPEF. I'm not going to spend a long time, but if you look at HEFPEF, the various types of conditions that lead to it, there's structural adaptations, uh, targeting functional adaptations, targeting symptoms. So we can look at various therapies. You can say acubitrol is one of the ones we're looking at. Uh, some of the SLG uh, stimulators. Avabradine for functional adaptation again. Diuretic therapy we know about. Uh, we are doing some things with antiretral septal, uh, creating uh, septal defects. See, that's helpful. Shunts. And then uh, some, I think the next thing here is me implantable LA uh, pressure monitoring to help us with those patients. So there's a whole bunch of things that are being looked at for HEFPEF because it's a huge issue. Remember, 60% of what we see now is HEFPEF, not HEFREF. So, and if all those people who are older are getting the heart failure, and they're half PEFs, and that's a lot of people. Big thing is avoid isodil. We hear it, often think it's useful, not how it's useful. Uh, the other thing is the systems management. We're getting better at systems. A lot of, so heart failure clinics is one thing, but only about 10% of people can see a heart failure clinic in Ontario. So we have to look at how can we involve other people? How can we get family health teams, get other groups of people involved in the management? Do they all need to see the cardiologist and be at least followed long term? So we want to look at ways to quickly up titrate meds, like a cancer clinic in that regard. And then once patients are on maintenance, can they go back to where they come from? Most of our patients in my area do not want to be traveling from King Carden to London in the middle of the winter to see me. Not a good idea. 
So we have to be come up with different things. So we have two projects funded by the Ministry of Health in Champlain Lynn, the Ottawa Lynn, doing a different approach, and then our Lynn has another approach with family health teams in the Huron Perth uh, region. Uh, oh, the slide didn't come out. But I'll just move on quickly to this slide. Um, remote monitoring, I think, is one of the other things. A lot of these people have devices in. We're getting some re interesting remote monitoring. What happens if we could tell if patients are starting to accumulate fluid well before they came to us? That would be something we could then intervene before they ever got to the hospital. So we have ways of doing it. Some people already have the ability in their ICDs or pacemakers. Uh, and then here's an example of a device by one of the companies. Again, improved in Canada uh, for us, and we're starting to use it, and I know that they use it. But again, uh, I think you're going to see more of this type of stuff as well as other types of remote te technologies coming along. And then LVADs for de destination. I'm, I have to put, I'm, I'm a transplant person, so I have to put that in there. You can see this is when I started uh, years ago. This is the size of things. In fact, I started with this, the, the total artificial heart. Then I went to this. And then I, we went from this down, so extracorporeal, now into these implantable ones, and now we're using devices of this size overall. Uh, we've expanded the indications for destination therapy, so for patients who are not transplant candidates, but otherwise would have a reasonable ability to func get, improve their functional capacity and would be candidates, have to be able to look after a device, that's a key thing. So a lot of, if you can't look after, you know, you're not good with, with your with your uh, mobile phone, this is going to be a bit of a trouble looking after this stuff. But we are funding it in Ontario uh, for destination. To, so we've now have, uh, we put in five so far in the last uh, year for destination therapy for us. So not a lot, but the market's there and they'll increase. I think that's it. Any quick questions before I move on? Yep. Yep. Very good. Okay, I, I gotta, I'm just going to pre preface your question just so we can move. So the, the question is basically some algorithms say as it does triple therapy before you consider the, evabrid, the uh, ARNI uh, or the evabridine, and some don't. And some people are purists. Guidelines are guidelines, they're not rules. So there are some rules we have to play, which is the government only pay for certain things, or your insurance company, some pay. but the bottom line is some patients, if you're on a good dose of ACE or ARP, you cannot be on an MRI. Your, pay, your potassium is too high. MRIs do not make people feel clinically better. They, are not, they have very little diuretic action, the drug level we're using. They probably have their biggest effects decreasing sudden death. So that's probably from potassium more than anything. So bottom line, if your patient can be on an MRA, great. I wouldn't hold off in doing the, uh, the sacrobitral valsartan. This is exactly the same thing that happened in Europe. In Europe, they are very rigid about it. The United States, not so rigid, and then we're somewhere in between. So the answer is, use your clinical judgment, no problems. And I would, Evabradine only decreases hospitalization, so it should be the last agent you use. So I would simply do it. Quick question. How are you counseling your young patients with heart failure and whom you're considering sacubatril about the unknowns with regards to nephrolysin inhibition and development of amyloid beta proteins and dementia and whatnot? Okay, good question. I've had a couple 40-year-olds who Google and say, oh, I, I don't know if I want okay. this. So the unfortunate reality is uh, this heart failure is a chronic disease. If you look at the SOLVE data, SOLVE trial from an allopril years ago, no one was alive at 10 years. I gave you an analogy of the cancer. It's that patient who looks great in front of you, his chances of being alive in 10 years is not very good. 
So That's you what I've been saying so, to so, myself. So if you so, live to dementia, we've won here. Yeah, but. I think the question becomes <laughs> yeah. a more important question if that drug ever evolves to a hypertensive agent. But for heart failure, no. Okay. Yeah. And we actually, the studies are being done. We're actually contributing to that. We're doing PET imaging, uh, but it's a non-issue for the heart failure patients. Thank you. But hypertension would be different. I think, yep. Yep. We're going to talk about it in two seconds. Okay, next. Okay, good. We're going to move on to, uh, to Maureen. Good morning. I know that was, I, I live and breathe heart failure, and that was a lot of information in, I guess, 40 minutes. Hopefully you guys are going to uh, absorb everything, but I'm just going to take it down a slower pace. Uh, we're going to learn some pearls of common patients coming to see you either in the hospital, in your office, in family health teams, um, both with allied health and um, practitioners. So our next topic, we're actually going to talk about heart failure and diabetes. Um, this has been a hot topic and actually there's a whole session tomorrow morning, I believe, on uh, these new agents and heart failure. But we're just going to highlight uh, this with a case study. It's a 62-year-old woman who, have, uh, who has a 12-year history of type 2 diabetes and 3-year history of congestive heart failure, secondary to non-ischemic uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. She continues to work part-time. She's currently functioning at an AHA Stage C, NYHA Functional Class 2. So if you remember the, the charts, she has structural heart disease. She is symptomatic. And uh, NYHA Functional Class 2 is basically she can do two blocks. She can walk two blocks or she can go up two flights of stairs before becoming symptomatic. Her medications, as you can see, she's on good treatment, ACE beta blocker, diuretic, and um, a medica hypoglycemics, uh, oral hypoglycemics for her diabetes. Her last admission for um, heart failure, it was two years ago, and, uh, but currently she was admitted for uh, hospitalization. Her blood work, you can see, uh, her sodium and potassium are normal, creatinine's just slightly up. Hemoglobin is stable, but her glucose is still elevated at 9.2. An echocardiogram revealed that she had dilated uh, left ventricle, moderate LV dysfunction with an EF of 30 to 35%, moderate MR, mild TR, and just uh, some elevated RVSP, possibly suggesting maybe some pulmonary hypertension. Her ECG shows that she's in sinus rhythm with an incomplete uh, left uh, bundle branch block. Now, in regards to heart failure and diabetes, these are the facts. Death from heart failure forms a large burden of mortality among patients with diabetes and atherosclerotic disease. Diabetes poses more than a two-fold increased risk of heart failure development. Diabetes as a comorbid condition is associated with worse outcomes for patients with heart failure. Now with cardiovascular disease and diabetes, we need to, uh, there's a need to recognize that diabetic agents still have a benefit of reducing burden of signs and symptoms of chronic disease and reduce hospitalization. We also need to be aware of the risk benefit ratio of any introduction of any medication, specifically renal dysfunction. Now recently in Jack, there has been a published uh, article in 2018. Um, it reached the state-of-the-art review of antihyperglycemic therapies to treat people with heart failure and diabetes. I'm just going to summarize this very briefly because this is not a diabetic talk, but I want to highlight that there has been several studies done on many different agents of many different classes, and there has proven that heart failure and establishment of type 2 diabetes with people with a hemoglobin of A1C of more than 7%, that certain agents have been beneficial to reduce um, complications with heart failure. 
The first one is the SGLT uh, inhibitor, two inhibitors. Um, and that's the sodium glucose uh, co-transporter inhibitor. And they have, uh, the new studies have come out and they potentially have shown that a, a significant reduction of cardiovascular mortality and hospitalization with heart failure. Other studies have shown that agents such as GLB uh, inhibitors, there is a caution of some uh, using these agents with um, hospital heart failure, but there is a potential reduction of CV mortality and atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease. When we go along the grid, you see other studies with DDP4 inhibitors. There was a neutral benefit. Um, such drugs would be your um, citagliptin, sactagliptin. Some of them showed some benefit. Some showed some increased risk of heart failure. And lastly, TZD. This is well known, the glitazones. Um, and these also show increased risk of hospitalization with heart failure. This slide summarizes, there's been 10 studies that have done over the last several years. The last two on the right-hand side has been the recent ones. These ones are the um, SGLT2 inhibitor studies, and they have shown, as you can see, a significant reduction of heart failure events when treating diabetes with these agents. So you have to ask yourself, where's the role of this with just lowering sugar and the combination, the interaction with heart failure? So we know that lately there's been 12 different types of medications to lower blood sugar with people with diabetes. And it's widely agreed upon that metformin still continues to be the first line agent. But after metformin, there's lots of controversy. So again, with all these new agents coming out, you still can't forget the ones that have been most beneficial, and we do agree metformin needs to be a first player. But cardiovascular disease is a major problem with people with heart failure. And blood sugar lowering in itself has either no or little effect on decreasing cardiovascular events. So again, we ask, what is this true mechanism? This newer class of diabetic medications do lower blood sugar by getting rid of sugar through your urine. It has a, um, the risk of hypoglycemia is not increased, which is a bonus, especially for people that are getting older. These drugs also lower blood pressure and weight loss, so that's an added benefit. And you know, if you see people who are diabetic and they lose weight on these drugs, they're gonna be quite compliant with these medications. So could GLT2 inhibitors be the drug category that finally reduces CV complications? So who would be the ideal candidate for such drugs? Well, patients with type 2 diabetes with cardiovascular disease, especially heart failure, if they have good renal function, it's an excellent choice. If they're hypertensive diabetic patients, another good choice. If they're overweight or obese, again, a good candidate. And if, t if these patients are, have frequent hypoglycemic events and they gain weight on other medic diabetic medications, this would be one drug to consider, or a class of drugs. The type 2 diabetic patients with adequate glucose control while on monotherapy or combination therapy you can still try to add this too because it's not going to tend to lower sugars. It still may give you the added benefit for heart failure complications. So the take home message for diabetes and heart failure is that the latest studies have shown that SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP1 antagonists can be considered as both diabetic and cardiovascular drugs. The cardiovascular benefits of the drugs appear to be independent of their glucose-lowering efforts. And as practitioners, we need to be aware of these drugs and these benefits. So back to our case study with our 62-year-old lady. What is our goals of therapy? Well, we have to ensure adequate glucose control. Maximize the metformin first. 
Her renal function was a little bit elevated, so we would have to keep an eye on that after we maximize that agent. We also should consider adding another diabetic agent if her hemoglobin A1C is not less than 7%. We should optimize her heart failure medication, because remember, we are treating now many comorbidities. We need to maximize the ACE, beta blocker, MRA, and if we got to a point of using those newer agents, make sure they're on the maximum tolerated drugs, meaning that their renal function stabilized, their potassium levels are fine, and their blood pressure is adequate. And you know, most of our heart failure patients, normal blood pressure for them is a systolic BP of 90. As long as they're asymptomatic, we press on. We also have to remember the importance of diuretics. This is clearly not disease modifying, it is just for symptom management. So we have to make sure that they are decongested and that they're optimized with their diuretics. And lastly, we can't forget the foundation of therapy for any cardiovascular disease risk factor, and that's exercise and diet. And we need to avoid the glitazones and, and some DDP4 inhibitors in heart failure patients, because they have proven to exacerbate these conditions. I'm just gonna pause. I know there was a question briefly, but hopefully, is there any? You know, they all, so, so the, the, ther the studies had a mixture. They just had heart failure. So these are why we need to have, see the results of the dedicated heart failure studies. So all they did is had heart failure as the diagnosis, whatever that might mean. All comers. Yeah. Okay. Comes. Okay. So then we're going to move on. So the next one. So I, the only thing I'd add to that is diuretics. When you're using SGLT2 inhibitor, you're going to, you may have to adjust your diuretics. So, so you, you need to check, watch their fluids, because you may not re require, or watch their weight. They may not require as much diuretic. Uh, with the SGL2 inhibitors. So that's the thing you have to watch. And that. So we're going to move on to something that people always ask us about, and that's the self-care uh, flexible diabetic regimen. So this is a case study of a patient, a 72-year-old woman uh, with a history of recurrent admissions for heart failure. She's recently discharged from a hospital. She was told by told the time to weigh herself daily and record the weight. Most recent echo shows EF 30%, moderate severe uh, MR, some AFib, um, comes to your office complaining of ongoing shortness of breath. She shows her her weight record. Her weight was 210 pounds on her home scale today. A week ago it was 206 pounds, and the week before, and before two weeks ago 204 pounds. So it seems to be going up. She looks like she's in pretty good heart failure therapy. Prindapril, good dose, eight milligrams. Bisoprolol, full dose. Beta blockers, spironolactone, frozomide, 40 milligrams. And then you can see that her blood pressure 108, heart rate 64, looks controlled. Got a bit of abdominal bloating. She's got the mitral MR murmur, some mild edema, and you can see her blood work. Sodium is down, 133. Suggests maybe a bit of volume overloaded. Uh, just a non-specific. Creatinine 134. B1 up uh, in hemoglobin 144. INR 1.2. Note that she's not on a. Uh, she's on the river oxygen. So, what? How would you? What would you be your approach with this patient? I'm gonna, for time, I'm going to take you through it. So I think the first thing we want to do is we want to inquire about daily weights and salt and fluid restriction, because that's the key thing in here. Because why patients come back to us has nothing to do with ACE. Well, hopefully they're on a good dose of ACE, ARB, or RNE, uh, they're on them. But why they come back to us is they have more advanced therapy as volume status. It's all volume management after that. So we need to make sure that they're watching their salt and, their, and, and they are weighing self. In this case, the patient knows to weigh herself. She's very good at that but she doesn't know what to do with the weights. That's the key thing. You need to do a, a good volume assessment. Is she putting on normal weight, good weight, or is she putting on wet weight? That's the key question. So you need to be able to assess her. And then the idea is, can we give her some sort of flexible regimen so she could address those weights? Because the weight seems to be going quickly, so she's probably wet, is most common, without even looking at her, just based on what she's shown me and those numbers. So just like a diabetic checking their sugars, you can adjust their insulin so they send them home, we can do this with the diabetics as well. Uh, and, but the challenge of self-care, of course, is mobility, cognition, social support. Sometimes the patient can do it great. Sometimes uh, families may have to help us. 
And sometimes you have to say you can only do it three times a week, for example, in a nursing home. But at least we get an idea before they fall apart. Uh, but the first step, d uh, step is adjust the diuretic before changing anything else. So um, I'll, do you want to do is take this over? So we can't um, emphasize um, more than enough the focus of self-care. Just, we just did the talk about diabetes, and you look at patients adjust their insulin according to their blood sugar. We have to get patients that we think are very competent and have the ability or have the supports to be able to do self-care management strategies. They need to adjust their diuretic according to their weight in order to stay in the target weight and they need to own this. It's another chronic disease, and that's the only way we'll be able. So I think as healthcare practitioners, we need to provide them the tools they need so they can do the self-care management. Uh, my focus in my uh, PhD dissertation is studying this very thing. We are studying a fixed diuretic dose versus uh, an adjusted diuretic dose, and we're going to look at outcomes with self-care confidence and the ability and do a sub-analysis on their social determinants of health and see if there's any correlation of their ability to self-manage. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to bring some more in, uh, research um, data to this field and, and look at the safety profile. But I think for now, in our, our heart failure clinic, we use these um, FDRs, flexible diuretic regime do, um, schedules, and we work with the patient to learn how to self-adjust. And so giving them the tools so they can self-maintenance and self-manage will be the only way that we can try to get ahead and try to decrease um, hospital readmissions. So just to recap, self-care is defined as the individual's ability to manage the symptom treatment, physical and psychological and social consequences, and lifestyle changes inherent in living with a chronic disease. We also need to promote the development and adaptation of self-care skills and do use the opportunities of pre-discharge education and transitional care programs. We also have to consider the patient's needs, concerns, and comorbidities, particularly cognitive impairment. And there's been many studies that have shown that just mild cognitive impairment people can still optimize and do self-care management strategies, but we have to select the right patients to do this. So going back to, as well as weighing yourself daily, which is paramount, is the diet of the low sodium and fluid restriction. And again, sodium restricted diet is 2,300 milligrams a day, and fluid restriction was at once 1.5 but new data has come out that says two liters is very sufficient. Now, I guess I would use that if you know someone in your office is going to over exceed, you may still give them 1,500, knowing that they'll go to two. So use your judgment on that. But this is strict evidence for this recommendation, or strict evidence of this recommendation is lacking, strong con uh, consensus is recommended. So we emphasize that with patients, this is a concept to do dietary modifications. We try to push that this is a philosophy rather than a religion. Now remember when you give them simple tools, patients, you know, they get a lot of information in the office. If we say to them, read the food label, and anything less than 8% per serving size is good. That's the green light but they have to look at the serving size. A lot of times it's just a half a cup or a cup, so they'll have to double that up. Also, um, read labels very carefully. Low sodium versus sodium reduced versus salt substitute. And as we know on certain soup, uh, cans of soup, sodium reduced can be instead of 37% per serving is 24. So still far beyond um, the recommendation for daily dose. Now, as well as diet and fluid, as I said, monitoring weights is very important. First of all, you need to ask the patient, do they have a scales, and is it functional, and can they read the scales? You're not, you can't assume that they have a scales.
They should be on the same scales, weigh themselves on the same scales every morning on an empty bladder, and they usually have the same pajamas, so it's consistent to what they're wearing. And normally, people can gain eight pounds before they start becoming symptomatic. And then it's too late. Then they're starting to drown and running into problems. We can all gain two pounds and lose two pounds on a given day, healthy, unhealthy. But it's the three pounds in a day or five pounds in a week. That is water weight. So if you think the patient doesn't have the skills to adjust their diuretic, follow the scale, the next simple suggestion is just saying um, every day weigh yourself and if you're up three pounds in a day, that take an extra water pill and get back down. That might be something very simplistic that they may be able to manage. Again, patients with advanced heart failure are unlikely to gain meaningful weight. So if they're maintaining their weight and they see you in your office every you know, three months, and you notice that they seem to be short of breath when they talk and their weight's the same, they may bring, if they have weight charts, you have to inquire what's your diet like. If they say, well, the last three months I really can't eat a whole lot, I feel really full, then they probably substituted their body weight with water weight and their volume overloaded. So again, take it into context to what their diet is like. Um, home diuretic protocol, this truly avoids hospitalizations. It works. The Heart Failure Clinic at St. Joe's in London, um, this is a key treatment plan strategy for them. We've put samples of charts of flexible diuretics um, at the back that you guys can even use. And in one of the sheets back there, we send patients home with a calendar. They can either use a, a yearly calendar at home and write their weight, or they can use this chart. And we tell them, when you're in green, you're two pounds above and below your weight. When you're three pounds over your weight, you're in yellow. And when you're four pounds above your weight, you're in the red zone. And at the back of that is like a traffic light saying what you need to do. Luji, the red zone, they need to contact their family physician um, or family health team to let them know that after a couple of days, they're still in red zone and they're running, maybe running into problems. We don't want them to be so short of breath and call. We want them to be proactive. So this, sorry, so this patient here, uh, what happened is, so I, I want to first acknowledge this. I took this from one of my days at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute, so that's where originally it came. So I didn't recreate the wheel. Um, so I think the idea here, this is, she, she was take your Lasix. We got her to go home and take the Lasix, and her weight kept going up. So she's always taking more. So we moved her from the 40, and you can see it took us, she required 80 milligrams a day. And you can see even with her diet. So there's probably some dietary things. You look at her weights, 207. So if her weight's 205, 209, she takes 80 milligrams once a day. If it goes up to 210, uh, she then takes twice a day, and hopefully that knocks her back down to here. Uh, and if her weight goes down, then she takes less. So basically it keeps the person in a range. And that's then the safety part. Because we send people on fixed doses, we're assuming they're not gonna, they're, that everything's gonna be perfect. So it works both ways. The vast majority of people will be like her, come back to you, and she would have ended up in hospital if she hadn't seen you before because her weight was clearly going up. And you saw the weight start off slowly and then start rapidly increasing. Uh, and so that's the usual pattern overall. Imagine if you had remote monitoring, as I was showing you before, and you knew that ahead of time, an alarm went off in your office or whoever's someplace, we could call her and say, what's going on? And I, I do that already for some of our patients. And they say, oh, I was on a cruise. How you caught me? Uh, so, and we can intervene in that. Um, so in her case, you can see she bumped up to 211. It looks like it was a weekend, I think. Uh, and then we bumped up the Lasix to 120 a day, just according to this, or whatever it was, and then we went back down accordingly. So that's how we adjust it, and we figure out what the best one is. But each time we have to make sure the weights are stay the same, and, and this is a way of controlling their plate. Their, their fluid status. We don't interfere with the ACE inhibitor, the ARB, or the beta blocker. We don't have to worry about those things, and it keeps them out of hospital. Key issues, though, it depends on, uh, can the person do it? 
You do have to think outside the box sometimes. As I said, nursing home, maybe three times a week, we can do the same thing for a nursing home. They can do it three times. If you're deaf, if you're blind, uh, what are you gonna do? Well, CNIB has talking scales. You're eligible for those talking scales if you're blind, so that's easy to get. Uh, some people, we have to use a fixed dose. So they just have to guess. So I just look at their pattern uh, and I might get some allied health in there initially to give me the weights at least. And then I can say, say, well, we'll do Lasix uh, every day and then we'll do metalazone every fourth day. Uh, so again, thinking outside the box periodically. But anyways, that gives you an idea of our uh, flexible diuretic regimen. So this person required a lot more Lasix than what we originally got, but this is what she ended up settling on and it seemed to work. So I think we, were gonna, we had a whole bunch of things like frailty and deactivation of ICDs and things, but I think the time is, to, I'd far rather just spend the time uh, asking questions. So if we want to do that, if, we, if there's time, we can do the other ones, but if you have questions, why don't we take the time to do that first? So the people, you have a couple options. One, you can go to the mic, tell us who, who you are and what the question is, or you can text the question in. You can text the question in. So any questions up, up so far? Any things you want us to comment upon? Just one over here. Uh, do you have any suggestions on what to do for the thiazide intolerant patients like with severe gout or some other thiazide complication in your max on this healer? Am I? So, okay, good question. So the question, I'll just repeat the question was, do we have any suggestions of what to do for the patient who is thiazide intolerant, i.e. gout as being the issue, um, and they're maxed out on their, their frozomide? So uh, I'm going to put the question back to you. What is the maximum dose of ferrosamide? Okay. Yes. So I think that's the first point. So there is a point in time when you. There's too much volume on board. That's why the flexible regimen, you can jump in here too. Um, there's a point in time when you gain too much fluid and more Lasix will not make any difference by mouth. It doesn't, it's diluted out. Uh, it takes too long to get to the kidneys and so you get any effect. So the only option is IV. That's why this is really useful. You don't get to that point. So the first thing is, unfortunately, you have to IV. So I think there's a couple ways you can do that. So one of our programs that we did is small Palmerston. We had a nurse and eMERGE. You identify that patient. You send the patient to the eMERGE, give them some IV Lasix, and then home. And then you, and usually a good dose of IV Lasix will do it. That's all you need to do, because it goes straight to the kidney. The IV Lasix will do much better. The dose you should use should be at least the same as what they're taking at home. Uh, and, and ideally actually two times as much. Now, I was asking that loaded question about what the maximum dose is. So in our heart failure clinic, we have people getting 500 of Lasix. Now, I'm not asking that you, but I'm just saying there's no maximum dose. So the thing is, first things, recognition that that patient's beyond, if you're true, one, assess their volume status, are they truly wet? If you think they're truly wet, then, and you can't get, not get any effect, then you need to bump the LASIKs. You may need to use IV Lasix. Now, gout is an issue. Uh, there is no easy way around it. You just have to treat the gout. So the issue, if they get gout, uh, with, and it doesn't get any better, so let's say, let's say we're, they get transplanted. Let's say they get a heart transplant, so it should solve our problems. No, gout becomes an ongoing problem because with our transplant drug, so everyone gets gout. So the issues would be uh, colchicine, uh, is usually the best option. Sometimes we do steroids. If the patient is really good, say they're really good at this type of stuff, then just like a diabetic in the insulin, I might say, okay, you can use an NZ for uh, a couple days. Just watch your weight, and if it goes up, then, we'll, then uh, and, that, and that's it. So it depends on the patient. And then you're going to have to get them, have them get on some, on some allopurinol or whatever to deal with it. So unfortunately, no easy ways around it. But they're never, we always, unfortunately, with advanced therapy failure, the thiazide you're going to use is metalazone, is most commonly, and there's no easy way around that. Any comments that you want to add in for that? Okay, question? Exactly. 
you just tell me. Yeah. So the question was amplifosin, uh, what dose would you start? It is a 10 milligram and a 25 milligram twice a day, and uh, we start with 10. Yeah. And, and remember, there's a number of trials being done with all sorts of them, so we'll, that's just one of the ones that are the drugs available. So. Okay. And just be cautious, there's increased risk of UTIs because they're peeing out the sugar, so um, just be aware and let the patients know of the signs and symptoms of that. Next question. Hi, uh, I'm Alex Peel. I'm a geriatrician actually working in Grey Bruce here on Perth, so yep. we're in the same place. I'm just wondering, have you developed a protocol for use in long-term care that's been successful, or are you aware of one? Because we know that there's tons of transfers coming from long-term care to hospital all the time with heart failure that maybe could be managed a bit better. So with uh, in long-term care, it's many PSWs and probably one um, RPN giving out medications. Um, our trick to doing this, they can't weigh everybody, but if we order Lasix and we say it's weight base, so they have to give, um, we set a target that this weight to this weight give 80 milligrams once a day, this weight, this weight give 80 twice a day. They can't dispense the medication until a weight's put in. So they have no choice but weighing them. And if it's a very large person and we know it's manpower, we may say do that three times a week. So we so they will would stick with the same dose for a few days. Based yes. On the weight of a few days ago. Yeah. And what we do is we actually ask them to fax their weight record to us every weekly or two weeks. So we get a trend because sometimes the nurses or the PSWs may not pick up. We then will have staff look at it and see the trend. And if they're going up, we will call and say, what are they like? Or is there... A lot of times they're not uh, symptomatic. They're not short of breath, but they're retaining fluid. Whether So we will adjust the diuretic and maybe have them come into clinic for a reevaluation of volume status and reset their target weight. Perfect. Okay. So we will fax those orders in and have them come in, not as often, but... Uh, just to touch base to reestablish a new target weight. Super. So, so, so practi practically speaking though, I mean, because you're in Owen Sound, you're not coming to London, and you're not no. going to Kitchener. So that's the bottom line. So, so again, it's nice to see us, but you, so I think the issue, you need to look at, can you do some weight situation? What is possible in your institution? So I think it's really important, your question is really important because if you look at data in Ontario, we haven't shown you that data, the most likely group to come back to a hospital after readmission is the long-term care mm -hmm. with heart failure. They're the longest, and when they leave, as you know, it's often get hard to get back in. There's all these challenges. So it's a really important issue. So our, uh, in Waterloo, we did a, uh, did a study there, and we basically worked with them, with the, the long-term care, to basically to come up with the individual protocols. We tried to have one protocol for all, and as you know, you know there's a lot of variables. It doesn't work that way. But a number of them came up with their own little protocols. Some say we'll do it three times a week. Some said the, the medication issues that Maureen's brought up was certainly one. Um, but I think a lot of the things we, could, we can sit down and work with you to develop a protocol for you, if that's helpful. Super. One other little quick question. Spironolactone, has that been something that we're not using anymore in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? So, good there question. There used to be this little bit of data from TopCat, right, that there was reduced uh, readmissions in people who took spironolactone in heart failure with preserved okay. ejection fraction. So uh, I, I do, I do. So, any, so the indications for, so, so the issue with spironolactone is there was a study done uh, that top, called TopCat looking at spironolactone and, and HEFPEF. Now, you have to sort of take, here's what it, the overall data didn't show any difference, but if you lived in Europe, uh, it, uh, there was no difference. If you lived in North America, there was a difference. So that's a retrospective analysis. So what's that say about our European colleagues? I don't think there's anything else. So I think people put a little bit of, you have to be careful about it. But the reality is if the only diuretic is, di is Lasix uh, and you're going to have to have some replace, the Canadian guidelines suggest that's actually an indication for spironolactone. So if you're on a loop and you're going to give potassium replacement, you might as well give them spironolactone, so we do. One of the most uh, difficult patient uh, presentations that I have trouble with is the combination of uh, renal failure and heart failure, particularly as you see it in diabetics. And I wonder whether you have any pearls. Okay. okay. So are you thinking of drugs, drug management? 
Well, sure. Yes. Uh, as you push the diuretic, sure. you uh, push up their yeah. creatinine, and then you're yeah. between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. So our threshold, um, everyone's a bit individual, but we first line is ACE and beta blocker. If your creatinine goes up to 180, you're getting close to 200. Then we will switch the ACE out and put hydralazine and Iserdil because it is safe for renal dysfunction. Uh, Again, that's an individual voice uh, uh, choice of how you want to reach that creatinine level. Uh, it depends on the age, how bad the heart failure, um, and wh what you want, because you're going to get more benefit out of the ACE than hydralazine and Iserdil. So that's one, one idea. The other thing is you really, first of all, want to check volume status. So if you're going to adjust any pill first because of renal dysfunction, are they too dry, or do you, are you very confidently assured that they're wet and you need the diuretic. Are they short of breath and you still don't have any volume? They might be short of breath for other reasons. So one, volume status first, and if you can lower the diuretic, great. But two, if there's still volume overloaded, switch the ACE to a hydralazine and Iserdil. Um, and then you may have to hold the spironolactone because that's your third line drug, right? So, um, so maybe that would be after the diuretics, keep the ACE and beta blocker and suspend or reduce the spironolactone. Okay, so I would do some of this stuff. A couple of things I'll make comments for. So number one is, uh, remember the ACE number trials did have creatinines up over 200 in the trials, up to 224 I think was the number. Uh, so you can do it. Some people will actually get improvement. If you actually look at the, if you look at the data with renal patients and who have heart failure and renal patients, they still get a greater benefit out of the ACE of the ARB if that's possible. So some sort of relationship with a nephrologist is a good thing. So see what your local guy is willing to do. Most nephrologists will say, we're okay with a 30% increase in their, in their creatinine. So that's fine. Second thing I'll say is the heart wins the battle, the kidney wins the war. Everyone thinking about that? A war consists of many battles. You gotta win each battle to win the war. You lose a battle, that's the end of the war for you. In the end, the kidney's gonna win. And so, at the end of the day, they can't breathe, you're gonna have to sacrifice kidney. So we have actually have a nephrologist who works in our heart failure clinic who, he's the guy who used the 500 of Lasix. Uh, he's very aggressive with the Lasix. But uh, I think that's an important thing. So we have to sort of, that's where your relationship again with a nephrologist, say, okay, here's my patient's getting worse. Do all the things that Maureen said, uh, because there is good data originally from hydrolysine nitrates, it's a bit of a pain to use, but there's data. The second thing is, you know, when we show you those little curves, you know, uh, um, for, for a, you know, for a, a survival curve, you never see that patient got the drug and got a 100% response, do you? So there's some patients that get benefit and some patients don't get any benefit. We do population-based medicine. So on your individual patients, a lot of older patients say, this patient's 82, 83, what are we doing here? Am I on my little piddly dose of ACE inhibitor gonna make a big difference to this outcome? Or is this guy just happy to not be in a hospital? And really, if I just do volume, volume control, that's gonna be the key thing. Because at 83, and he's got renal failure with heart failure, his mortality is very high. So being pragmatic, talk to him, and this diuretics. And beta blocker if you can, but uh, not the ACE temper. So I think you have to do a little bit of thinking. All the basics are things that uh, Maureen said originally. We do those first to see what happened. By the end of the day, we're stuck with them. And uh, so we, in our heart failure clinic, for good patients, we're doing PD. That's a better option. Um, again, that's why we have a nephrologist there, but it's a huge issue. Okay? So is there is any evidence using SGLT2 inhibitor in non-diabetic um, overweight individual? Um, I think it was only studied for with diabetes and heart failure. So um, I think we'll just leave it like that for that well, treatment. Well, well, well no, but we can say, I mean, I, what I can say, it's under study. We can say it's, it's currently under study. The, the study, two of the studies have been completed. We're waiting, uh, we're waiting follow up. But at this point in time, no, uh, def, no, no, no recommendation can be made. Good to see you. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is John Hay. I'm an internist in Hawkesbury, Ontario. My question is about Lancora. Uh, so just this past uh, 10 days, I've had this lady come in with rapid atrial fibrillation, 160 minutes in this cold sweat with, uh, with chest pain. 
uh, and some renal insufficiency, and she's diabetic. And uh, so she was, uh, she was uh, amiodarone in her, her eyes, in her eyes. Anyways, that give an idea, amiodarone. So uh, she converted to a sinus rhythm um, at about in, in the 90s, and we've been giving her a beta blocker. Uh, she's not really responding well to it, still about 90 minute, and uh, she uh, has had a troponin go to 1300. So she's an acute coronary syndrome. She, no, she has known coronary artery disease. Uh, so she's waiting cath, but you know I wanted to get her heart rate down, and uh, so I, anyway I, I, I signed off, and so we're still trying to get her beta blocker. I think but I just wondered about this Lancora. I hadn't used it. Okay, so Evabradine is a called a funny channel inhibitor. Uh, it works uh, more closer to the sinus node, so it's not a good idea for a person with atrial fib. And, and so I think that's the first thing. But so she's in sinus now, she converted to cor Correct, but she probably, you don't know how much she's in paroxysmal atrial fib, and that's actually one of the complications of it, is you can get atrial fib, makes it worse. So I think you have to be a little bit careful on that. So first thing I'd say is, is her atrial fib correctable? Is, she, is her atrial fib because she's wet? She had MR, TR. Clearly you need to get your cath and get that figured out. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, Encore is only for patients, or Vabradine for patients who have sinus rhythm, uh, it, it may make atrial fib worse and no benefit for patients with atrial fib. Now for your patient, let's just assume we're going to take, take the change of scenario, it's got a heart failure and you have this scenario, intolerant beta blockers, has atrial fib on and off, uh, amiodarone on it goes, then if the patient is a, you know, one option is actually AV node ablation and a pacemaker. So for patients who are more advanced, that's what I do, and actually get good results. Then we don't have to worry about drug intolerance, uh, et cetera, and the pacemaker. And the pacemaker we're gonna give you is a CRT device as well. So that's the better option if you have drug toxicity or drug adverse effects. Uh, I just think that, you know, I've done the same thing as you've tried, and uh, I won't say I live to regret it, but uh, you know, those patients in heart, who have heart failure diagnosis, they go in and out of atrial fib and they just felt horrible on it. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Other questions? There are two, two from the web. <clears throat> First, they're both on uh, fixed, uh, flexible uh, dosing. First question was, uh, do you have the patients do additional lab work or routine lab work? Yes, most definitely. So that's our safety net. So. Um, we first have, we will uh, give them a set target weight. We send them home with a flexible diuretic, and then we have them come back to follow up within a week. And we do blood work, um, lights and renal function. Um, make sure they're stable on that. Then we'll tell them to come back maybe in two or three weeks and repeat, make sure they're stable. When we know that things are great, then they can just, as an outpatient, do monthly um, blood work or, and keep an eye on it. Yeah, so, so coming back to that question too, I think the other key thing is, remember when you're doing this flexible diuretic regimen, you're being a teacher. So I would suggest to you, the first step is, can your patient show to you that they could weigh themselves, record their weight, and then bring it to you? Because that's the, way with the first step. You need to be able to, they could do that. When they can do that, step one as a teacher, you're gonna go to step two, just like you do teach any skill. Step two is you're going to introduce the flexible diuretic regimen. Step three is you need to bring them back and see can they do it. Because you know, for a lot of old people to say, you know, I can't really adjust the dose. Even though the doctor told me, I only do what the doctor tells me, I'm not going to do it. And so sometimes they have to be readmitted to get, well, if you adjusted your dose, we wouldn't be here today. And then you learn it. So there's a whole step, a teaching step. So I think you can do it in that regard. Second nice thing about the other thing is if they do do the weights, the nice thing is that once you got the blood work once or twice, the blood work will be the same. As long as their weight stays in the range, I like that, if you measure their blood work, it won't be any different than it was before. So that's a nice safety valve for, it, uh, right. for that. The second question uh, relates to using this type of algorithm for CKD patients with heart failure. And if it's restricted or do you do not use it? Do exactly the same. 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 Yeah. It's yeah, just even more important. Yeah. It's just they're going to require a higher amount of diuretic, and that's where they need the patient teaching. They just think, oh my goodness, I'm not going to take 80 milligrams twice a day where, you know, someone else is only taking 40. And we said, it's a reflection of your kidney function being poor. You need double the amount to even start with. So when they know that, I said, it doesn't matter how much 
it is. It's what the dose is for you to maintain a dry weight. And when they realize that other people are three times the amount, they're like, oh, they assume they're not as bad. But uh, we we'll just leave it like that. Just, just think like you would insulin, diabetics, same thing. Yeah. Some people re require more, and it becomes even more important for us to do it. So we, this is one example. We have a page of different ones. So we have, you can imagine, 20 milligrams PRN, 40 milligrams PRN, 20 milligrams a day, 20 milligrams BID, 40 milligrams, 80 milligrams, 120, 160, with metallozone, no metallozone, kilograms, we have in Portuguese, Chinese, we have it all different languages. We have one drug we didn't mention is Bumex or Bumetamide. It uh, has a better uh, um, uh, profile for patients who are, tend to have more Anasarca type patients, so volume distribution. So that's what we use for patients who might need a lot more Lasix uh, and for volume overload. Uh, generally often, so that's another option. So there are other drugs we can use as well. Now we have 30 seconds left, and I think uh, it's our obligation to kind of bring home the key messages. Yeah, but you. while we are, yeah, there we go. So I think one of the things we wanted to say was that, again, recognize that heart failure is a, uh, is a big burden of heart failure disease. Uh, rising Canada, as our population ages, it's going to get worse. Uh, and so management is much more than a heart failure clinic or cardiologist internist. Only 10% of patients see it. The vast majority of patients are looked after by other, by other, other allied healthcare and family physicians, nurse practitioners, etc. High mortality, but treatable. Um, and there are lots of options available. So our take home messages is heart failure is a syndrome. It has high morbidity and mortality associated with it and reoccurrent hospitalizations. But new treatment options can significantly improve the outcomes and quality of life. It is also important to recognize that there's gaps in heart failure management, including social issues, ability for self-care, use of allied healthcare practitioners, and optimization of evidence-based therapy where possible in order to decrease hospitalization and improve quality of life. Thirdly, heart failure is a chronic progressive disease with increasing better uh, outcomes, but it's important to recognize frailty and opportunities to discuss patient goals and initiate management and end of life discussion when it's appropriate. Lastly, new heart failure treatment options are now available. They have shown to improve outcomes and quality of life. More options are anticipated over the next several years and may further impact the disease process, particularly diabetes and amyloid. In addition, there is increased interest in remote monitoring and assessment of technology, which will help us guide heart failure management into years to come. Yeah, I, I would say to you people, I always. I, I jokingly say to my colleagues that we are really the heart failure, we're the cancer clinic of heart disease, which is hard for cardiologists to accept because they're all doers. Uh, but the reality is that's what we are. I've suggested to you the mortality is that way, so we need to treat aggressively. But again, therapies do allow us lots of great options. When I first started, five years was a good outcome for our, these patients. Then it became 10 years. Now I'm seeing people. 14, 15 years with good outcomes with severe LV dysfunction, with good care, and it's a combination of not just drugs, but the systems management, how to use the drugs, et cetera. So I think, and now new drugs will make even better. So thank you very much. So I just want to thank everyone for attending this session, and also I want to, on behalf of Heart and Stroke, thank you for our amazing speakers. Uh, welcome your question afterwards in the foyer. We also have lunch being served, as well as there is an accredited industrial sponsor session on, um, in the same room on caring for our elderly patients, AFib in the elderly, and also fitness thrombosis and embolism in primary care. So enjoy the rest of the conference.